we too stuck like glue. Are we talking about relationships that go the distance, building relationships that stick, building relationships that go the distance? Uh, there are a variety of kinds of friendships, relationships you can experience. Most of the ones we experience in our culture are really casual. Uh, they're a mile wide, an inch deep. They're shallow, often superficial. Sometimes we move past casual to close. Uh, these are people that we share some of the same common interests with. Given time, these relationships might grow, might develop, might become more, but right now they're just close. What we're going for in this series our covenant friends, stuck like glue friends. We're talking some of the relationships that we see in the Bible. Uh, the relationship between Naomi and Ruth. Anybody remember those two, those two people that are described in the book of Ruth? I mean, we're talking about a covenant relationship on an entirely different level. And here's what I love about that relationship so that you understand what I'm talking about. That relationship wasn't contingent upon same age or same period of life. Naomi was a really old woman and Ruth was a much younger woman. They were at completely different stages in life, but they developed this amazing friendship that transcended age and became something actually redemptive in our history. We're talking relationships like that, relationships like the relationship between Elijah and his protege Elisha, the relationship Jesus had with people like Peter, James, John, the 12, and then some other friends like Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, the relationship Paul had with people like Timothy, even the relationship he had with a guy named Barnabas. And I know some of you who read the Bible, you're saying, time out, time out. Didn't Paul and Barnabas get into a spat? Yes. We're talking about real relationships, not pretend ones. So they got into an argument. They had to do conflict resolution, but they had this amazing friendship. But, but the friendship that got us started to thinking about this this was the relationship, an amazing relationship between a guy named Jonathan, crown prince of all Israel, and the relationship he built, the friendship he built with a much younger guy named David. I love the fact that in 1 Samuel chapter 18, the Bible says this, Jonathan became totally committed to David. He became his number one advocate and ally, and Jonathan made a covenant with David. And that covenant relationship actually transcended, superseded the friendship, loyalty relationship Jonathan had with his own dad. Because when his dad became unethical and actually ordered a hit on David's life, who did Jonathan stick with? Jonathan stuck with David. And they maintained that friendship even after Jonathan and Saul's death. In fact, in the wake of Jonathan and Saul's death, David remembered the covenant friendship that he had with Jonathan. And one day, and I love this story. Oh, it's one of the most beautiful stories you will read in your Bible. David came to this realization one day. He thought about the covenant he had made with Jonathan and said, is there anybody left of the house of Saul that I might show him the loving kindness of God? And they could only think of one, and that one should by all accounts have caused him to be rejected and neglected because he was crippled in both of his feet. Somebody stepped up and said, yeah, there's one, but you wouldn't want anything to do with him. After all, he's a cripple, He's a reject. His name is Mephibosheth. It'll be hard anytime you have to call his name. I mean, just think about that. You're really going to be up against it. But he lives in a place called Lodabar, the place of no pasture. And David said, bring him to me so that I can show him the kindness of God. And I love this story. When Mephibosheth gets into the presence of David, he prostrates himself. I mean, he lays down flat on the floor because he's expecting to receive the judgment of David. You see, in those days, kings took their rivals very seriously. And a living, a, a living relative of the former king could represent a threat 
to that king. So the common practice was wipe them out, behead the dude, get rid of him. David says, oh, Mephibosheth, you don't have to be afraid because I don't intend on doing you harm. I only want to show you loving kindness for your father, Jonathan's sake. In fact, from this day, I know you've been living in a place called Lodabar. The word means no pasture. It means a really dry desert, barren hide. You're not going to live there anymore. From here on out, you're going to sit at my table like one of my sons. You're going to eat right here. When people see you, they'll no longer see a cripple. They'll see one of the king's sons because everything that once belonged to your grandfather Saul, I'm restoring to you. That is the kindness of our great God. Those are the kinds of relationships we want to build, right? So you, you, you're ready to dive in because here's what I want to talk about today. Last week I gave you, I gave you the glue that's necessary for covenant friendships. We're talking same direction, same values. We're talking unconditional acceptance, right? And we talked also about the importance of total commitment and loyalty. Today I want to give you, this is going to be one of the most simple messages you've ever heard me share. But simplicity Simplicity should not be mistaken for lack of meaning and content because I can guarantee you, listen, my wife and I have been married, uh, how long is it now? 36 years. I knew that, just thought I would test you. <laughs> 36 plus years. Uh, when I talk about four action verbs that work like super glue in your relationship, you need to know what this is born out of. It's not born out of us doing everything right. We have made every mistake in the book there is to make when it comes to relationships. Uh, if, if we were to write about our successes, that would be a short booklet. If we were to write about our mistakes, that would be an encyclopedia. But over 36 years of marriage and a lot of years of friendship, I can tell you that these action verbs, you put them into practice, they work. In fact, I tried to form this into a memorable statement. So the big idea, it's going to come up on the screen and we're going to say it a couple of three times together. <laughs> I, I can't overemphasize the importance of all four action verbs. You put these into practice, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a parent-child relationship, whether it's a marriage, in the workplace especially. You put these into practice and it can't be a one and done kind of thing. In other words, if you do these today and expect your relational world to transform, I'm sorry, these don't work like that. This is a long obedience in the same direction over the long haul. It takes years of putting these into practice. And all of a sudden, you look back and you see, oh my goodness, we rebuilt, we reformed the culture of this relationship by that decision we made November 10th, 2019. So let's say it out loud and together. Appreciation, communication, celebration, and forgiveness are the super glue for relationships that stick and go the distance. I'm just going to turn all of these rhymes into a rap song one day. Thank you, Isabel. Your confidence there just overwhelms me. Let's, 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 let's say it again. You ready? Appreciation communication, celebration, and forgiveness are the super glue for relationships that stick and go the distance. You ready to write? Here's action verb number one, the super glue for great relationships. Appre appreciate. Appreciate. Stuck like glue friendships and relationships are the byproduct of relationships where people love and care for one another enough to express encouragement, affirmation, and appreciation on a regular basis. They intuitively know the importance of expressing gratitude. 
You need to know this about your relationships. Culture in those relationships will either happen by design or default. And most of us choose default. Think of it this way. You don't have to work at being critical. It's just natural. It happens. But you have to work. You have to get really, really intentional. If you're going to be thoughtful, encouraging, affirming, kind, and grateful, get this, you will never simply drift into gratitude. One of the actions that will radically transform your relationships over the long haul is developing the art of expressing sincere, regular, continual, consistent appreciation, encouragement, affirmation, and gratitude. So I want to ask you this question. Do you regularly let the people in your relational world know that you appreciate them? Do you regularly express your gratitude to them and for them? Look at what Paul says about this. Philippians chapter 1. He's writing to a group of people that some scholars say represent the favorite church he ever planted. What's interesting about this church, it was planted out of the context of a lot of personal harm to Paul. He actually suffered to plant this church, but he loved this church. So look at what he writes to this group of believers. Philippians 1, verse number 3. Every time you cross my mind, this is in your notes, I break out, everybody see it, just say it out loud, in exclamations of thanks to God. Each exclamation is a trigger to prayer. I find myself praying for you with what? A glad heart. And this isn't the only time Paul says stuff like this. In fact, I, I had to limit the number of encouragements, challenges that people like Paul give us in the New Testament to express gratitude on a regular basis. So I gave you one more. 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Encourage each other. And build each other up. I'm going to ask you again. Do you regularly let the people in your relational world know that you're grateful for them? Are you intentional when it comes to expressing gratitude? There's an expert in this field. His name, Robert Emmons. 2007. World's leading, I didn't even know there was such a thing. World's leading expert on the subject of gratitude. He began, he began researching gratitude through a psychological lens. Here's what he found. He found that expressing gratitude has a variety of effects on us. It improves, he wrote, our mental, physical, and relational health and well-being. Being grateful, he wrote impacts our overall experience of happiness and the effects, he goes on to say, tend to be long-lasting. In fact, his research revealed the following benefits of gratitude. Think about this. The following benefits of gratitude. Improved physical, emotional, and social health. Greater optimism, outlook, and happiness in life. Improved feelings of connection, especially during times of stress or crisis. Increased amounts of self-esteem. People who are grateful for other people, they tend to feel better about themselves. Heightened energy levels. Anyone ever feel like you're working from a depletion in terms of your energy? Turn up the gratitude. Strengthened heart. Immune system, decreased blood pressure. Isn't this interesting? Just being grateful actually has a physical effect and makes us healthier people. Improved emotional and academic intelligence. This is research, guys. Expanded capacity for forgiveness. Decreased stress, anxiety, depression, headaches. Improved self-care, greater likelihood to exercise. If you wanted to get into the gym, try being grateful. It triggers something. <laughs> Heightened, this is research, spirituality. The ability to see something bigger than ourselves at work 
in this world. Guys, if it just gave you abs and caused you to lose 10 pounds, it would be the perfect action verb, right? This is the power of gratitude. How are you doing when it comes to gratitude? Here's what most of our homes are filled with. John Gordon has written an incredible book. I highly recommend it the book. It's called, it's called The Energy Bus. It's one of the most simple books you'll ever read in your life. You'll probably read it in one sitting because it's so simple and yet powerful. And Gordon writes in that book about how our world is filled with what he terms energy vampires. For the sake of this message, I'm going to call them relational vampires. These are the people who suck suck. I mean, they immediately suck the life, goodwill, happiness, beauty out of everything and everyone around them. Anybody got anybody like that in your world? How many of you are married to something? No, don't raise your hand on that one. I mean, you can almost see them coming, right? Anybody, you see a particular person coming and you immediately start looking for an exit. Because they, they tend to give off this vibe. Please come closer. I want to bite your neck. Suck out all the dreams, beliefs, vision, beauty, goodness there is in your world. Give me two seconds to suck you dry. Anybody got anybody like that in your life? Maybe as I say that, I'm asking you to be really, really introspective. Maybe as you think about that, your initial thought is, oh my goodness, I'm that person. If that's your thought, today you need, you need to come to this conclusion. I'm driving a stake through the heart of my draining, complaining, critical attitude, I'm going to become CEO, chief energy officer of my life. I'm going to determine that from here on out, instead of a complaining critical attitude, I'm going to develop an attitude of gratitude and I'm going to begin being thankful to God for his grace and for the people he has graciously placed in my life. So everybody say appreciate. appreciate. It's the first action verb. Here's the second. Communicate. Communicate. Relationships that stick like glue are relationships where people work on communication. They actually spend time talking and listening to one another for the purpose of staying connected. They realize that as, as the communication goes, so goes the relationship. And they realize when it comes to communication, communication involves a lot more than exchanging information. I gave you the definition for communication in your notes. We'll bring it up on the screen. Here's what communication is. Communication is a dynamic process between two or more people that involves, let's just say these things out loud and together, talking, listening, and understanding. Leave it there for just a few moments, David. Most of us excel at talking. We get in a conversation with someone, we don't really listen to what is being communicated to us from that person. We're only internally thinking of how we're going to reply next to what is being said. Most of us excel at talking. Some of us are somewhat good at listening. Many of us fail at understanding, but all three are critical. And do you know the goal of communication? The goal isn't talking. The goal isn't listening. The goal isn't even understanding. Do you know the goal of communication? Not a place to write it in your notes. You just might want to jot it down somewhere. The goal of communication is connecting. It's connecting with the other individual. And sometimes that will require a lot more listening than talking. Often. So let's talk about 
communication, how we go about it. First of all, the words that you speak are critical. Not in your notes, will not even come up on the screen, but it's important. Proverbs 18, 21 says this, words kill, words give life. They're either poison or they're fruit you choose. Here's my question based upon that passage. When it comes to your relationships, are the words you're speaking poison or fruit? We choose every day. We choose countless times every day to either sow words that are poison or sow words that are fruit. Proverbs 13, 17 is in your notes. An unreliable messenger can cause a lot of trouble. Anybody experience that in your relational world? But reliable communication permits what? Everybody say it. Progress. When you put your communication under a microscope, does the way you communicate either throw up walls or permit progress? A few days ago, I read Colossians 4 verse 6 and my wife and I got into a discussion about it one day and I told her about how God is challenging me in this area when it comes to the way she and I communicate. Check it out, it's in your notes. Be gracious in your speech. Be gracious in your speech. The goal is to bring out the best in others in a conversation. Oh, I've got to say it again. The goal is to bring out the best in others in a conversation, not put them down, not cut them out. Amen. So a few thoughts about communication. Let me fill in the blanks. Number one, first bullet, quality communication takes time. Not necessarily a lot of it, but time. I want to add uninterrupted time. Let me just share with you one of the biggest obstacles we have to great, growing communication. This right here. It impedes more progress in communication than is imaginable. When your friend is sharing heart with you and you look away from them and say, oh, oh, I've got to take this. You just shattered the opportunity for intimacy. Unless you're the president of the United States, you're not that important. Let me just challenge you. When you're talking to another human being who is before you, looking in your eyes, giving you the greatest gift they can give you, presence, put this away. Put it away. Don't look at it. Don't be interrupted by it. Put it away. Turn it off. Put it on silence and look into the eyes of the human being that you are gifted with the presence of for that moment. Well, thank, thank you, Derek. It deserves more than an amen by Derek, so you just lost your opportunity. Second bullet, communication involves more than words. Janet, can you help me, please? Just come here and stand beside me. Uh, there's this UCLA uh, professor, his name, Dr. Albert Morabian, and he came up years ago, Janet's nervous, came up years ago, don't worry, sweetheart. He came up years ago with a rule that is widely accepted as an incredible rule when it comes to communication. It's called the 738-55 rule. 738-55 rule. Bring up those notes if you would on the screen. And here's what, here's what the Moravian rule basically says. Effective communication consists of 7% content. This is really interesting because what I work on more than anything is content. I mean, I am a hawk when it comes to content. But Morabian said, and this is documented, read, up, re read the study. He said effective communication only consists of 7% communication. Sweetheart, 
on Thanksgiving Day, I would like to eat turkey and dressing, green beans, mashed potatoes, please, and I would like a pecan pie. That's content, okay? <laughs> I need two ushers, please. I need two ushers to escort this person influenced by the evil one out of this room. She said, if you didn't hear it, she said, go to Cracker Barrel. Get thee behind me, Satan. 7% communication. Now, he said 38% is tone of voice. So did you notice tone of voice is, sweetheart, for Thanksgiving, I would like turkey, dressing, mashed potatoes, green beans, a pecan pie, please. That's, that's tone of voice. He said the most important part of communication is, does anybody see that? 55% is what? Nonverbal. Non it's body language, facial expressions. Now, I can communicate this. Obviously, I don't really care what she cooks for Thanksgiving. I really don't. Because <laughs> it, 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 it'll be great, whatever it is. And, and I'm not just making a show. It, it really will be. We, I, I don't really care as long as family gets together. That's cool. But there are a variety of ways. I come, I'm... I take soap, I, I go overboard. I'm, I'm the head of my house. <laughs> hey, woman, <laughs> for Thanksgiving, I want turkey dressing, mashed potatoes, green beans, and pecan pie. I just ruined any chance of that if I'm literally trying. <laughs> and the same thing goes. Janet could respond to me, you know I love you, don't you? And that would mean, oh, I might get sweet potatoes, mashed potatoes, green beans. You know, I love you. Or she could go like this. Just, do, just show them that you've got that in you. <laughs> she could respond, you know I love you, don't you? That gives me an indication you're not getting any mashed potatoes, green beans, turkey dressing, or any other dessert, if you know what I mean, for a long time. You love me having you up here. Yes. Give Janet a hand. Give her a big hand. You're done. Hey, hey, take out. Look at those notes, those passages I gave you on communication. And by the way, the third bullet, effective communication. Communication involves the art and skill of, of listening. Proverbs 18, 13, do you see it? Answer before listening is both stupid and rude. James 1, 19, post this at all intersections, dear friends. If you're looking in your notes, can you say the next words out loud and together? Lead with your ears. One of my favorite ones, something I say to myself, my wife is probably saying this about me right now. Even fools are thought wise when they keep silent. With their mouth shut, they seem intelligent. You sure showed out today, honey. <laughs> Communicate. Three. Everybody got it? Everybody say appreciate. appreciate. Communicate. Communicate. Celebrate. Celebrate. Here's what I can tell you, after 30 some odd years of working as a pastor, the majority of people would never put item three on their list. I was raised in a really, really, really legalistic church. My attitudes about marriage and family were formed by one word, discipline. My older children tell our youngest daughter regularly, you didn't know dad before grace. <laughs> because the message of grace totally wrecked and revolutionized my life. For several years, I was a disciplinarian. I thought that my role as a parent was simply to discipline 
at some point, something caught on that my legalism was not creating an attractional model that was compelling to my kids and made them actually want to follow Jesus. It just caused them to conform to my expectations when they were in my presence. Jan and I changed our paradigm and we came up with this idea. I know it wasn't original because I know we're not that smart, but we determined this. We want to create the kind of home that when our kids leave, they actually want to come back to. And only grace, radical, reckless grace provided for that model. So for a few years now, I've been talking about this, that we need to recover the importance of celebration and joy. I just talked about it in May of this year. In fact, that day, we actually sang songs that involved dancing. And some people didn't like it. Some people just didn't like it. It proves the point. It proves the point. The ESV, the words joy, rejoice, joyful, they appear over 430 times. Check out Proverbs 17, verse 22. It's in your notes. The passion translation is amazing. A joyful, cheerful heart brings healing to both body and soul, but the one whose heart is crushed struggles with what? Sickness and depression. Jan and I determine in our home, we, we don't always get this right, but we've tried to live this model for a couple of decades now. Joy and celebration is going to be something we not only strive for, but we plan for. In fact, Bill Bright said this, it influenced me years ago. He said, as long as you're gonna be married for the rest of your life, you might as well enjoy it. Hey, parents, as long as you're going to be parents for the rest of your life, grandparents, as long as you're going to be grandparents for the rest of your life, you might as well enjoy it, right? Friends, as long as you plan on having that friendship for the rest of your life, you might as well enjoy it, right? You know, there's this powerful model, Nehemiah chapter 8, the people come back to the land of Israel. They gather, they begin to rebuild the walls. God begins to restore their destiny. And then Nehemiah has a gathered worship experience and he has priests stand up and the priests begin to read the word of God in front of the people of God. And as the priests begin to read the word of God in front of the people of God, the people are hit with this realization of, oh no, there's this huge gap between who I am and who God is. And the whole congregation of returned exiles, they begin to weep. And Nehemiah stands up and he says, time out, not today. Look at this, Nehemiah 8.10. And Nehemiah continued, everybody say it out loud, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who've nothing prepared. In other words, be generous. Don't keep this to yourself. This is a sacred day before the Lord. In other words, rejoicing is sacred. Amen. Laughter is sacred. Celebration is sacred. Amen. Don't be dejected and sad. Nehemiah is not saying that there's no place for sadness and for weeping, but he is saying this, sadness and weeping can't give you strength. For the joy of the Lord is your. Oh. Come on, Janet, to the keyboard. Here's what, here's what Nehemiah is saying. 
He is saying there may be a place for sadness and weeping and mourning, especially when we experience loss. But know this, sadness, weeping, mourning, they can't give you strength, but joy produces strength. Joy produces power. Joy gives us the wherewithal to go on and fight for another day. So he says, now I know, I know, I know not everybody likes this and not everybody agrees with it. Every time I say it, I get pushback, but evidently it is a biblical principle. So Nehemiah says, he's speaking to exiles, people. He's not speaking to people who've had life given to them on a silver platter. He's speaking to slaves who witnessed the massacre of their own families. But he's saying, I know, I know there's a tendency in you to get sad and dejected, but not today. Choose joy for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And then Paul would say it like this. Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. What? Oh, he just wrote that from a prison. How about this? 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17. It's going to come up on the screen. And I gave it to you in three different translations. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. That's a recipe for total health. Always be joyful. That's a recipe for emotional health. Never stop praying. That's a recipe for spiritual health. Be thankful in all circumstances. That's a recipe for mental health. Paul says, you can choose joy. Here's how the voice translates it. Celebrate always. And here's how the Passion Translation gives it. Let joy be your continual feast. I gave you that little footnote A because if you click on it in my smart Bible, it says this, let joy be your continual feast regardless of what season of life you're in. Some of us need to choose joy. Here's a relationship game changer. Just bring it up if you would. My relationship game changer. Take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. Wait just a minute. I got to say it again. Just, just don't, don't give me any movement because I'm getting something in my head and it's going. Take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. I gotta say it again. It's it's getting it's tweaking right here in my head. Take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. Take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. Take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. Take every opportunity. To laugh and have a party. Oh, it's getting there now. You know what I need? I just need some musicians. I need, I need a bass that can thump. I need a guitar that can wail. I need a drummer that knows how to take a little funk, add some soul, add some rock and roll to it, and beef it up about three notches. Because what we've got to bring to our relationships is this idea. Take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. Take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. Why don't you just say it? Take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. Take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. Take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. Take every to laugh and have fun. <laughs> oh yes. That's that's oh that's Bobby McFarland. Now I know some of you you're getting stressed right now. You're, you're, you're so stressed out right now because you're in church and you're like, oh my gosh. 
didn't sign up for this. <laughs> so so let, 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 me, let me just ease your mind a bit. Jesus, Jesus, the one you say you follow, Jesus, do you see that in your notes? I put this for you in your notes because I wanted to make sure people knew I was being biblical. Jesus regularly aggravated the religious crowd because they would say things like this. He can't be all that spiritual. After all, he loves to party. He came eating and drinking. And the Phillips translation translates it like this. The son of man came enjoying life. Have you ever thought of Jesus that way? That when Jesus walked about, he came enjoying life. In fact, when Jesus announced what he came for, he said this, the evil one came to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I came, look at the Amplified. I gave it to you in your notes. I came that you might have life, have it to the full, have it till it overflows. What Jesus was saying was take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. Take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. I think we ought to do that right now. I brought, I've never set off one of these, but I've always wanted to. It's called confetti cannon. Cause I didn't want you to mistake anything. Hey, y'all didn't get the cue. I said when the music starts. Y'all crazy people. How about, how about, let's add a little bit of juice to this, a little bit of soul, rock and roll, funk. Let's see if we can help the people take every opportunity to laugh and have a party. You ready? Give the band a big hand while you are seated. Help me out there, Janet. Um, the key of goodness of God, please. Help me out. You may be seated. Everybody say appreciate. Communicate. Celebrate. What would happen in your relational world if you started planning for celebration? You, you're going to have to. Here's the fourth one. I'd be remiss if I didn't say it. And, and I want to do this totally unplanned. Mary Elizabeth, I want you to come right here and stand beside me. Don't worry, it won't be the Janet deal. Um, here's the fourth one. Forgive. Forgive. Now, last week I gave you a big idea. Anybody remember that big idea? Um, I, I talked about a good friend they point you in the right direction 
They always let you in. They never let you down. That was a little bit of poetic license. Because friends will let you down. Here's why. You don't have a friend that's perfect. The only friends you have are human. Uh, I, I wanted to say something about Mary Elizabeth. And Mary Elizabeth, I've had this on my mind about three days. And you and I are three weeks, excuse me. You and I have talked about this in person, so it won't be the first time you've heard it. Okay. So um, Mary Elizabeth started with us back at the old campus in Vestavia. Really interesting how she found out about the church. <laughs> really, but it's cool, right? Okay. Uh, we had a guy at that time, because when, when you start a church, uh, listen, you, you know what? You, you just start with anybody the Lord gives you. And we had a guy who played with our band, who also played at Mickey's downtown. <laughs> and <laughs> that's a bar, in case you didn't know it. And uh, very good looking dude, really good looking dude. And uh, Mary Elizabeth was there one night and this dude was playing and she walked up to him and said, I'd love to hear you play more. Where can I? He said, well, I play at this church called A2 Church. Why don't you come? <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> she came. Glad my husband's not here. Oh, yes. <laughs> But he was just a good looking dude. That, that never became an item. She's married to a beautiful man now. His name is Sydney. Uh, and, and anyway, she, she came stuck and stayed. Actually became uh, the first person we ever actually hired on our team. Worked with us a number of years. And uh, I say all this because I want you to know real people hurt people. And there came a situation in our relationship when I spoke, I spoke words. Mary Elizabeth was working in our office, working regularly, and I spoke words that just, they would have hurt, wounded anyone, but hurt and wounded one of the most precious people you'll ever meet that walks this planet, a beautiful child of God. I mean it, those words just, I, I don't even know why. I look back and I can't even figure out why I would ever say the words I said to this beautiful child of God. And, and I don't mean curse words, I don't mean that. They were just, how many of you know, sometimes we look at those passages in the Bible that talk about communication and we think, oh, I don't cuss, so I'm okay. Please know that most of our words that we say to other people don't have to involve cursing to hurt deeply. And I hurt this beautiful woman of God with my words. Here's what, Mo, here's what Mary Elizabeth offered me. When I did not live out the definition for friendship I gave you last week, a good friend always points you in the right direction, always lets you in, never lets you down. When I didn't live that towards her, she lived it towards me. You know how I know? Most people, when the pastor says something wrong, they just leave. That, that's, that's their, that's their uh, coping mechanism for dealing with conflict. I'm just out of here. Mary Elizabeth kept showing grace by showing up, listening to the very broken man that had said harmful words to her, listening to me teach week after week until the Lord moved in my heart and basically said, you are one idiot, dude. When are you going to get things right with her? And I remember Mary Elizabeth and I sitting over at Starbucks right across the street and me saying, I don't even know why. I can't even understand why I said what I said. I acted the way I acted, but all I know is I need you to forgive me. Would you please? And she offered me the grace of forgiveness. Here's the other cool part. I did get to, I mean, this is forgiveness, right? I got to officiate at her wedding. That's really cool. I mean, just grace being poor. That's a real friendship, people. That's, that's real forgiveness. I just say thank you. I, I know you couldn't hear what she said to me, but she just said there, I love you, brother. I love you. That's the way she's always treated me. That's what a real friend looks like. Give this woman of God a big, big. Amen. 
so let's say those four things. Appreciate, communicate, celebrate, forgive. Father, shine a light on us as to where we need to deal with any of these. 